Um, I'm going to speak loud, even though I have a microphone. Um, uh, welcome uh, this to our tonight's program. The, the program is um, Community Solutions to the Loneliness Epidemic. Um, who here had fun playing peeper, people poker? Awesome, yeah, a pretty good way to kick off a, an event about solving loneliness. Um, I'm Neil Gornflow, I'm the executive director of Shareable, and um, Shareable is one of the two organizations putting on the event tonight. Um, we are very fortunate to uh, partner with uh, Ken Burroughs and his class, Relaxation, Stress, and Stress Reduction. Who's in the class? Raise your hand. Okay, awesome, yay. I, I, I could have used this kind of class when I was in college, let me tell you. Um, all right, so yes, thank you for having us. Thank you for letting us crash. Um, how many of you have heard of Shareable, students or not? Raise your hands. Okay, great. All right, so we got some, some people in the house that know about us. So, so for those of you that don't know about Shareable, our mission is to empower people to share um, our programs are we do publishing, campaigns, and, um, and also consulting with all the, the, uh, the point is to get more sharing in the world. Um, and we're really uh, mostly known uh, for our online magazine at shareable.net. Um, and and you know, th that brings us to tonight's program. Tonight is the first of four of what we're calling par participatory Magazines, wow, that's kind of a mouthful. Um, we're doing four of them this year. Um, each magazine includes an in-depth editorial series published on shareable.net before the event, um, a live and live streamed event, and an e-book that wraps everything up. Um, here, who here read at least one stories, story in the series we, we've published? Raise your hand. Okay, great. Um, uh, for those who haven't, you'll be getting the ebook. We'll email it to you, and um, and you know, wait for it. It'll be you know a, a few weeks. Oh, we're we're designing it right now. All right, so shareable, you know, and and along with Ken, we wanted to tackle loneliness uh, because it's now an epidemic um, in the U.S. and other developed countries: U.K., Japan, South Korea. Um, today. The average American has only one confidant. That means a person that they can tell their troubles to, right? Um, and, uh, and that's down from three since 1985, right? And, and if the average is one, that means there's a lot of people that have no confidant. Um, and, and, and loneliness is terrible for your health. Um, a recent study showed that it's like worse than smoking 15 cigarettes a day, and it's associated with a greater risk of depression, dementia, um, heart disease, anxiety, and probably some other stuff. Uh, but, but loneliness isn't just, or just doesn't create a collection of sick individuals. It also, it also creates a sick society. Um, you know, it weakens the social fabric. You know, the, the, uh, the social fabric, the, it's the foundation of our society. You know, states with low social capital um, suffer from high rates of of, of violent crime, uh, poverty, um, tax evasion, and more. And so, you know, what do we do about this, right? Well, I want to sh share a story um, from my life, um, really briefly, to illustrate what this night is about and what, and also what Cheryl is about. So, let me take you back to 2005, um, and. And um, you know, this is before shareable and the whole sharing economy thing. And and uh, I'm I, I'm between careers and also friend circles. I'm I'm a bit lost and a little lonely too, you know. And um, but I did have this hunch. I did have this idea that sharing could be and should be a big thing. Um, maybe the next step in the sustainability movement, you know, because I'd done. I had done corporate strategy. I had worked for some environmental NGOs, and no one was talking about sharing. But it seemed like common sense. Like if you if you share, you reweave the social fabric. You know, you save resources, and you know there's more benefits. Um, so uh, you know, living in San Francisco, um, and I figured like, well, if I'm going to do something about sharing, I better find other people who want to do this, who who are also interested. And you know, um, there was no one that I could go to that I knew. Um, right away to talk about sharing or plan something together. So I just started talking to people. One day I saw um, there was an SF Weekly thing, um, and it was about this 
thing called Superstar Avatar, and it was by this guy Scott Lefkoff and his 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 partner Polly um, Superstar had had. Uh, had um, hatched and it, it you know it, it kind of expressed a lot of the values that I was interested in and I didn't know Scott I emailed him you know we met up you know one thing led to the another uh, and we started our own event series uh, called the the Abundance League and it was just a monthly thing where we you know would do a, a gift circle and we would do um, you know have like a performance or a speaker right and um, you know I ended up doing that with a different you know and Scott are you in here? Well, Scott's in the other room. He's going to do one of the sessions, but just you know, you'll you'll meet Scott. He was my partner in starting this along with Mircea Schaefer and and uh, Polly Whitaker, um, and you know, I ended up doing this for five years every month, right? Um, and it just completely changed my life because I made so many good friends who I connected with uh, around purpose, around um, what we were each passionate about. Um, contributing to the world, you know, so the whole thing about Abundance League was trying to create a, like a post-scarcity world and a post-scarcity like evening, like what would that be like um, where you could bring your most generous self and connect with people who want to do projects for the common good and get help with your project, give help, right? That was the whole idea of it. And, um, and then, you know, after about 18 months, um, I had this incredible network of hundreds of people that had been helped by this and, and that had, had helped me, and my life really began to change. Have you ever, guys ever heard that concept of, uh, in psychology called flow, right? Well, I entered what I felt like was a, a, the social version of flow. And um, because everyone knew what I was interested in sharing and creating a sharing world, um, my friends that I made through the circle would network me. They'd tell me who I should meet. Um, and if I needed anything, this network would provide. And oftentimes it provided things I didn't ask for that I didn't need, know I needed, right? And opened doors for me um, that I didn't know were there that were just for me, right? So it was another way of being in the world that was, uh, it was transformative. Um, and, and through that, uh, you know, I not only learned a lot about sharing and met this, this incredible group of people and built a social life, one of consequence, of purpose, uh, that was, uh, you know, still as alive and uh, today, um, and and it also it also led to the formation of Shareable, right? Um, and so, you know, fast forward 2009, we start Shareable, and then, you know, here we are, here we are today, right? And and um, and so, the part of the story, and there's a, there's many lessons, but the one I want to uh, key on is, and that's relevant for tonight, is that there's a lot that each of us can do right now with what we have um, and who we know to meet our challenges and, um, and do it together, including social isolation. And, and you know, we can get really creative with our friends, our families, our neighbors, you know, to make our lives better. Um, and sometimes, like in my case, make them dramatically better. Um, and you know, you don't need any permission. You can just do this kind of thing, right? Yes, there are fundamental challenges in our culture, our, our economy, and our political system that help create lo loneliness, and we need to address those challenges, right? Um, but these larger structures, you know, they take some time to change. In the meantime, we have our lives to lead, and we want to make the most of them, and often the best way to do that is to do it together, right? So tonight is about exploring what each of us can do to solve this problem in our lives and communities. You know, the goal is to catalyze action. That's what Shareable is all about. And to help you or maybe inspire you um, to create solutions together. And, and what we want to, you know, what we'll want to know after tonight is what are you going to do differently to make your lives better? And, and you know, we don't, care, uh, we don't care how big or small you think your change will be. We want to hear about it. And we'll be following up with you after this event to find out you know, with your permission. Um, so here's what we're going to do with the rest of the evening um, to help us spark action. OK, so in just a moment, I'm going to hand things over to Ken. Ken, raise your hand. Your students know you. Uh, he's right there in the middle. Um, hopefully, your students know you. Um, so he's going to ma uh, moderate a panel discussion with our hand-picked experts from various facets of, of society. And I'm so thankful for you guys being here. Thank you very much. Um, and and uh, 
And then, then Kent is going to hand things off to my colleague, Tom Llewellyn. Tom is the one that ran Purple Poker, and he's going to uh, facilitate two rounds of small group discussions in the breakout rooms that are just outside this room, right? And in these, you know, these discussions, you get to pick which ones you participate in, right? And, and um, you know, I think this is where things could get really juicy and, and you know, um, you know, where you can explore ideas and solutions and, and maybe even start hatching a plan. Um, and, and then we'll all gather back after the two rounds of sessions and we'll hear reports from the discussions. And, um, and then after that, you know, we'll, we'll close out the evening by asking, you know, asking you guys, you know, maybe you have some ideas of what you might do differently after tonight. I, um, I'm going to want to hear about that, and and um, and then I'll share a few reflections, and and that's how it'll roll. Um, so let's let's dive in, Ken. It's all you, man. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear us back there? You can just use your voice. Is that all right? Um, we'll use this because this is being recorded, so this doesn't enhance what you hear here, but it's good. Wonderful. If you can't hear one of us, we do have a mic here and we can, if, if we're more subtle and you can't, please let us know and we have a mic that we can also use, a, a double mic. So um, here we are together and the suggestion would be that we're gathered here because uh, governments and corporations are not solving the problems that we're dealing with as far as a society. And we, we're, we're entering into this ageless process of thinking together in conversation. Right, that's what we're doing tonight. And we've gathered here a, a number of uh, community thought leaders that have something to add to this conversation, we think. And of course, we'll continue this conversation as we go into the breakout rooms and, and you pick a, a specific conversation to be a part of. And many of the people on the panel here will, will be leading those events or participating in them as well. So uh, we hope it doesn't just get juicy there, but also here on our panel. We're hoping that we actually can heat things up a little bit we scheduled about an hour for this, but we're starting a bit late, so we'll, we'll, let's get going. Uh, to make this somewhat informal and really less of an expert and audience, but really seeing all as participants in this conversation, let's start with uh, maybe uh, on this end here, uh, Paula. Um, um, our first question, what is it that brings you to this topic? What, what qualifies you, do you think, for talking about this very important topic, uh, your background, any life preparation, anything? Wow, I'm the lucky one that gets to go first. So um, my name is Carla Perisinoto. I'm a geriatrician and palliative medicine physician. Um, and I have actually been working um, on understanding this topic specifically in older adults um, for, I don't know, about 11 to 12 years. Um, and it actually started when I was in residency here in San Francisco. Um, I was working in the hospitals. I was working in clinics, seeing my patients. Um, and I was very intrigued at understanding um, what are the things that help us stay independent um, as we get older, um, as our lives change, as our communities change, and what are the things that drive some of us to end up having to live, having to live in nursing homes. Um, some of my patients did very well when they moved, um, and some of them didn't. And I didn't really understand why that was. Um, I'm trained as an anthropologist before I went to medical school and in public health, um, and so I always knew that there were things outside of the, the typical biome biomedical model. Um, but those aren't things that are, that are taught well in medical school, and certainly once you start doing clinical work, um, the things that are described as social problems kind of leave the realm of what we do as physicians, and that was deeply troubling to me. Um, and so I embarked actually on some research um, really initially because I had to do a research project. Um, <laughs> my professors may have made me do this. Um, and then I realized that I became very intrigued with the topic and I just started searching through some databases and found, actually found some questions on loneliness and I had never really thought about this topic. 
Um, and so I started delving into, well, what is loneliness? And, and also realizing that people were using the terms loneliness and social isolation interchangeably and realizing that they mean very different things. Um, and how we, how we go about finding solutions to these things are very variable. Um, so to put Tom on the spot, so I was horrified in the other room getting called to play people poker. Um, so if you were to ask me that it's not the way to make me not feel lonely and isolated, it would probably draw me more into a corner. Um, so that is an important thing as we think about what are the right approaches because one thing that may work for another, one person may not work for others. So it, it did work in some ways that I spoke to one person in my corner, so I was very happy in my little corner speaking to one person. Um, but I was not going to be the one that went around. And so it makes us, again, think about if I'm a as a physician and as a clinician thinking about my patients, if I tell all of them go play people poker, they will freak out, some of them. And some of them will be like, that's a great idea. In a similar way that for some of my patients, when they're losing their independence, um, living in a communal environment like a nursing home or assisted living may be a good option for other people who enjoy their solitude, which is different than loneliness. It's just trying to figure out where people are. So that's really where I come from this from. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Hey, everyone. My name is Mazin Jamal. And um, yeah, I think what I want to speak to as far as uh, my place up here is that about four or five years ago, I was in one of those chairs in not this class, but others of Ken's classes, and, um, talking to like listening to Dr. Chavez blow my mind, and and have over the last few years uh, been lucky enough to take a lot of these ideas of okay, how can we use sharing and use a subversive way of changing our system um, to be a way of living and also have that be my job and not have to work and exchange my time for money doing something that like doesn't feel in alignment with my values. Um, so kind of a little bit of, of what that looked like was me and a couple of people in this room actually, what's up John and Matt and uh, Shaka and a lot of us are part of uh, various kind of intersecting communities but um, it was a, a thing that started a lot with sharing. So we, we were uh, people who were artists and activists and um, here at SF State and, and in other parts of the San Francisco Bay Area. And we're like, man, activism's awesome and we have to do it. And then I'm kind of in this cycle of burning out. And then I'm like, okay, well, let me go meditate and be in this holistic world. And then I'm like, okay, now I'm not involved with the movement. And bringing those things together, bringing together art, activism, healing, we started to bring together these sharing circles, these uh, monthly events where you know, people, maybe 30 people would get in a circle and we'd be like, okay, well, what do I need? And what do I have to offer? And we'd go around and everyone would share, what do I need, what do I have to offer? And like, you would be so surprised how many relationships and trips to Tahoe and new languages learned, new instruments learned, companies started, brands coming in and out. Uh, because we found that sharing and exchanging in uh, our services and in our, in our, our things that we owned is a way of building community that's like, so so deep right you think about like you think about the people who are like yeah, that's my real friend right it's like the person who helps you move when you need to move it's the person who cooks you a meal when you're sick right doing things for each other sharing and exchanging things build these really really deep bonds and so um you know years later as the work has evolved we still you know we actually just were at um what is it when people are going to get married? They have an engagement party. An engagement party of, of two of our friends, um, who are I think like the third or fourth group of people to get married, who like met in these circles, these sharing circles, you know? So um, yeah, I guess today, you know, as I wanted to make myself available if, for anyone who wants to talk about what does it look like to, you know, leave the institution where we have all this support, this kind of design community uh, of learning, and to continue on uh, bringing what we're doing here, you know, because we have access to these really radical things, uh, out into the world in, in whatever creative way that we, we can. It's so cool to be here, and thank you, Ken, for uh, inviting me and uh, having me be a part of this. I teach at San Francisco State, and I'm also a product of the Historic College of Ethnic Studies. I graduated from that uh, department in La Raza Studies, and when I graduated, I know that I was told, 
what are you going to do with that? And how could you study something that you already are? And, and you know, it's, it's like it's, but at the same time that I graduated, I learned these skills of something called community-based research. You know, that you never do anything outside of partnering with the community. And that whatever you're learning in school, in a classroom such as this, which I'm sure has a community component, a personal practice component, and that you, you can't just learn theories. And so then I worked in uh, child abuse prevention, violence, youth violence prevention. And eventually I ended up studying public health. But I studied public health as a way to reduce violence. It, I studied health to examine the root causes and risk factors of a sick society that is uh, only increasing. It's this global phenomenon of loneliness and social isolation, uh, it, it completely ma makes sense in a fast food nation, right? So there was a book back in the day that everybody should read because it just really predicted what we have today, um, that we have created uh, a, a belief system that people are disposable. I mean, that literally you can delete and swipe and change and shift and move and, and, and live within this, you know, in this te technological world um, without really exchanging anything related to the heart. Mm. So we started today with food in the other room. And then we walk into this other room and there's music and there's smiling people. And it's agradable, we say in Spanish. It's, it's, it, it, it's a feeling that is a happy, friendly feeling where you can be okay, right? So I, being a professor here, I, I was hired to teach community organizing and I knew I can't be ideological and tell people about how to organize and what the problem is. It's, you know, that drives people crazy. But you can bring out from a student-centered perspective what matters, what matters to people, and how to do work together to uh, see what, what could be our part in preventing, in intervening, in treating. Uh, disease and problems. So just to end, I want to say that being here so many years, I realize that it's not enough to examine and to address social justice issues, even though it's vital and essential. You have to meditate. Yeah. <laughs> you have to dance. You must breathe, and you have to learn and practice how to breathe better to maximize our oxygen capacity. And to do it together, and to not be afraid to wear comfortable shoes, to, to be in an environment where you can just relax, right? Um, it's so important. So combining <laughs> the community organizing with the personal wellness, I, I've just been able to feel um, more that I can, it's like two wings of a bird, right? So that we could fly. And so thank you. So I'm, I'm going to keep passing the mic because I'm basically a moderator for the panel, but just to acknowledge this event itself is part of the 13th season for, for nonviolence, practicing nonviolence. We, we call it the Gandhi King season for nonviolence because it, it's between, it's nine weeks between uh, the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi, which was January 30th, and April 4th, uh, which was uh, Martin Luther King's uh, memorial date, the day he was killed. And then we extended into Earth Day, the larger we've carried this out, so we actually are including the Earth now. So we actually have 11 weeks of practice. And so this is the closing event before Earth Day, just acknowledging that we live in a violent culture and that there are ways we might bring more, more uh, connection, uh, love, meaning, and, and certainly less violence. Because nonviolence is really not a, a positive expression. It's not being violent. Mm -hmm. So there are certainly, uh, how do we look at character strengths? And how do we look at uh, the better aspects of human nature and invite those out and not just look at the problems in the world. So we need to, and in fact, uh, I'm very passionate about what I call constructive media. Maybe I'll add a thought about that before we finish. 
that we're really not getting the media that drives us to think about our potential and what we're really for. We're getting media that keeps us very concerned about the problems in the world. And that's not making it, that's giving, creating a huge hope gap and, and really broadening cynicism in our culture. So um, uh, this event is itself a, a creation between Shareable and, and the university and my class because we want to acknowledge the, the culture we've been creating and that we really have options. So can you still hear us all right? Okay, great. Okay. Yes. Before, can I ask about that? You Please. Said, you said some hope gap. Yes. You were hope. Yes. It's so funny where that word was 10 years ago to what it is now, hope Ooh, gap. So why, why do you think we have that? I'm, I'm, I just want to ask you. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Why do we have a hope gap? Why do you think we have a hope gap? Yeah, I think, I think that's a great question. I, I think we lack a shared moral story to begin with. Yeah. We really lack to share a story that's uniting us across our differences, that we, we're, we're thrown into, into this hyper-individualism uh, that's uh, reinforcing us thinking we need to solve our problems ourselves. And that means we're less interested in connecting with others. And so even when we say hello and the connections we make, they're often uh, social rituals that often aren't full of meaning anymore. We don't really speak to each other. We, so there's this increasing disconnection we feel and I think therefore we're, we are becoming uh, somewhat hopeless because we don't feel our collective power. There's money power and there's people power. You think that's being more prevalent now? I think maybe. very much, yeah. It's coming maybe from, from the top? Well I think it's coming from our also lack of participation and really uh, looking at our own options. I can speak more to that when there's a moment but uh, it's, it's a great question. That's one of the reasons why I'm not here but we can go. Yeah and that's, that's uh, Let's all answer that question or speak to it. Please. So why are we here and what do you bring? Right, the question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my name is Marie Applegate, and I am with the Asian Art Museum and Creative Compassion Initiative. Um, I'm an artist, curator, and experienced designer. Um, and something that um, Tom may not have known when he invited me to be on this panel is about 10 years ago, um, I started a social coaching business. Um, and did that for a couple of years and helped individuals one-on-one. -on -one. And something that I learned from that is that there's a desire to connect and what's lacking is the knowing how to connect. Um, so I think that that was my biggest takeaway from when I did that a decade ago. Um, I'll fast forward to today. Um, right now, I focus m mainly on Asian Art Museum's Village Artist Corner, um, which is right in the Civic Center in San Francisco on the corner of Larkin and Fulton. And there we have um, large-scale public murals as well as interactive installation pieces. Um, and that occurs, there's an activation that occurs there every month on the first Sunday of each month. and. Usually there's um, an experience that's tapped into cr the idea of creative compassion. Um, and so in these installations and in these experiences, we invite people to come together. Um, and if they haven't received the invitation, we meet them where they're at, which is on the public streets. So people happen upon this. And I think part of that um, connection is going out there and reaching out for someone can be really challenging or difficult. And so when we meet people where they're at in the public spaces, I think it releases, um, it's less, there's less friction because they're already there and we're already there. Um, and so in those spaces, um, through the different artistic um, activations, we invite people to maybe be a little bit awkward together while they're participating and get past awkwardness and land in the, the vicinity of vulnerability. And in vulnerability, I think that's when um, we invite each other to, to meet us where we're at emotionally or mentally or spiritually. And that's why I'm here. Thanks. All right. And uh, you say, uh, I learned a lot about it. Uh, I had a clue that it was a little bit deeper than just something, you know, health-wise, but I really didn't know until I started doing a little more research and asking people. I mean, I went to places for the store. I went to places like uh, uh, workspaces, shared workspaces, and, you know, you just, uh, 
just come up and just ask somebody, introduce yourself, tell them what you're doing, uh, where you think it might at times be awkward initially, and you start asking. Tell them what you're doing. And you wonder why that they're there. Are they there because they like being in the shared space? Is it because they don't like to be alone while in their creative space moments? I, I got some interesting things and, and very good comments. When it came time to like asking for their name and what they do, there was some hesitation and reluctance. So we're kind of a um, bit scared to talk about if we battle with being alone or maybe experience bouts of loneliness or at times we may feel isolated. Uh, and I, I found that to be really um, interesting and intriguing because uh, one, it could be we're scared, could be shamed, um, and maybe 10, 12, 15 years ago, we probably wouldn't be, but I think with the, the way technology has just advanced and, and how we put our lives kind of like out on social media, we may not want to be known for that in some way. And so that's what I found um, really intriguing that. Um, and the term I kept hearing, you know, we're so uh, technologically connected, but at the same time, we're also disconnected. And I guess I came across a lot of those uh, examples. So, so that's, that's why I'm here. And as I said, I, I share a lot of the same views that Neil is, so I'm not going to uh, be uh, redundant. So I'm ready to just go into the questions. If you actually look epidemiologically at what's going on, um, and it, is, it, is it really rising prevalence rates, or is it that we're doing a better job at measuring? And so, you know, there's a question about, um, you know, if, if in studies we never ask the question, we don't really know. A correlate example is when HIV was, uh, was developed and diagnosed, women were not included in the definition, I believe, until 1993. And it wasn't that suddenly women had HIV, it was suddenly that we were including them in the definition. So we have to be careful with understanding, are we really seeing rising rates, or are we understanding more? That being said, we certainly have greater risks these days, and there is concern in certain populations about increasing risk, and actually, you know, not wanting to be ageist and stereotype here, but younger generations um, are, are at pretty high risk, and we think it's partly because of how we're using technology and how we're interacting with each other. Um, so I think it's something was mentioned down around here about treat and etc. But it's, it's like all in Sudan and I'll go to the capital city which has a lot of the same cultural uh, kind of practices as here where everyone's kind of hustling and trying to do what they're doing and then I'll go back to a village where my dad or my mom are from and you can literally go into anyone's house and there's like a bed out that you can just sleep in that night and no one will really ask you why like that's that's the social norm um, so I think there is it, it's really interesting you know two days later someone will be like hey everything all right um, but, but for the, for, you know, the given is that we're all sharing, right? We're, we all share, and so there's a sense of belonging. Unlike here, we just walk past and don't ask. Yeah, I mean, we literally, we, I've literally seen people walk over people here in San Francisco. Unless it's your bed. Right? Yeah. You know, so I think that there is definitely something um, about culture, and it, and it is in a way timeless. It's like, there have always been time, you know, you could go into, uh, like, some time in European history where all these people were wearing their fancy, you know, and if you were part of the aristocratic class, you might be really lonely because you were part of a culture that wasn't uh, grounded in a sense of we're all together. And then you could go to that same country out into like the, the folk areas where everyone's farming and everyone feels cool again, you know. Uh, but it just so happens that it was that culture, you know, with the ties and I'm superior and I own the land, etc., that was then exported all over the world. And, and once again, it's, it's a very specific culture. Right, and that same culture is now exists in Sudan. Like I go to Sudan, or I, I, I'll go to Cairo, uh, where some of my family are, and like it's the same thing. You go to the capital city, and everyone is really, really moving fast. It might be technology, but you can even go to a rural area now, and you'll see kids with phones. But because the underlying values of their culture is different, the way they interact with technology is different. Right, like a lot of people in my family, they use WhatsApp and like our whole family around the world is on this WhatsApp app. We're sending videos, we're, it's like we are so together. Like I open it up, I hear a voice from my grandma, I start crying, right? So technology is amazing, but it's, re it's a knife and you can use it to cut an avocado or a finger, it, you know, it's really just how you use it. So to wrap, to wrap that up, 
I, I think it's what are the underlying values that are driving us that are of that culture and how can we base our cultures on values that make belonging and maybe even a sense of purpose right at the center, right? Like what are the values that make humans belong, sensing that they belong and sensing that they have a purpose right at the center of our culture? So good. And how, how do you... <laughs> How do you know you belong? Yeah. What, is, what, is, what does it look like when you belong? Right? What are the messages that we are uh, uh, receiving? Mm. You know, I think that the immigration story really matters to answer this question um, because that placement of having one foot of uh, being U.S. and one foot of being from not U.S. gives you this perspective that's pretty expansive so that you really some of us in this room we really understand individualism we kind of enjoy it the privacy the ability to leave me alone it's not your business it's my business right we like that but then the downside of that we also know that in some other cultures we like that people care right that there are all these messages that that um, that people are asking you questions that people are inviting you to places that people have asked you so so much right so this this is very well rounded information in understanding what values are and I and I want to I think this aspect of cultural humility it really calls me uh, terminology because understanding our values is critical like who who are we like, who am I how do I fit into this society what do I think is the right way right and then opening that up and questioning it uh, the power dynamics are how are we able to power? I think that this power is very divisive and it separates. So when you are with less power, right? Like you said, the people in the village, right? It's a little, so you share more. It's, it's counterintuitive because you have less, but you share more. And sometimes when you have more, you're more afraid that somebody's going to take it, right? So we protect it. Understanding power, being able to reach and then to balance power relationships, that would also reduce some of this loneliness. And finally, the institutions, holding our institutions accountable, even the way that we are given rooms as teachers, right? So we might have lots of wonderful ideas for how to build communities, but look at the room and how it's set up and how it's there's a front and a back, <laughs> and you're all divided, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Right. So that's an institutional way of creating loneliness and social isolation. And then we're so used to it, we accept it, and now we want it online. So <laughs> online is supposed to be, it brings access, this is being recorded, we are grateful. But you know, I teach summer school, and it's so quiet on campus, because all my other colleagues, when they teach summer school, they do it online. And their classes are filled up because people don't want to come to campus. They don't have to. They don't want to have to deal, you know, with the commute and with having to be present. So, yeah, I just <laughs> like sigh. I think that if things are not good or bad, that they, there's both this interplay. It's it's always this tension, right? So I'm appreciating that there's a link that other people can have access to this information. But I know that without the in-person that we've already done before we started, that we're doing now, and that we'll do later in the smaller groups, it's not the same meeting. It's not. Great. So uh, we want to speed this up just a little bit because of our time commitments tonight. So let me add the second question or the third question to yours and play with either one that's more powerful. So we talked about, uh, in your view, why are so many of us lonely and isolated, but also what community-based solutions would you think would really make a difference? So why are we so lonely and isolated and what do you think will make a difference? Um, so I think that um, loneliness is 
part of the human experience. And I think that is an important part of the human experience because it creates longing. Um, I think we're saturated with it, though, at this point. Um, and I think that I don't think we've actually defined loneliness here yet. So I'm going to kind of just throw a definition out there. That's my working definition. It's when, um, for me personally, it's when I want to connect with someone about something, about a feeling, an emotion, even music, whatever it is, and I don't have someone to connect with on it. Um, that makes me feel lonely. Um, and so I think that right now we have so many different ways to connect with each other that it's like overwhelming at times. I don't know when I, so I grew up in the Philippines. When I first moved to the US when I was 16, it was like going into a grocery store here is like way different and I got overwhelmed with all the options and choices that I just like slowly backed away <laughs> out of the grocery store because it's just like, it's too much. Um, so I think there's, so, there's a lot of breadth and not a lot of depth. Like what we mentioned earlier about awkwardness, like people aren't willing to go past awkwardness. Like if it doesn't keep feeling good, it's not, it doesn't, it's okay to like move on to the next thing. At least that's what it feels like these days. Um, so that is, oh, sorry, and the other question? Community based solution. solution. Well, we're all here, right? Here's one. Yeah. <laughs> we're all in this room together. I think um, um, the gentleman over there was talking about um, like community, like monthly, weekly gatherings. I think ritualizing things is really important and powerful. Um, I specifically focus on public spaces. And to me, like um, meeting people where they're at, I think public spaces are like you know, are flowing rivers of people. It's like our daily temple that we all walk through together. And I think that that's a really powerful thing to break through the barrier of just making it a thorough space and actually making it a gathering space as well and connecting with each other in those spaces. And so um, one of the solutions is, is hopefully like basically the work that I'm doing is is meeting people where they're at in public spaces and allowing them to connect with each other and be vulnerable in a way that um, where they feel seen and heard and I totally agree with you um, so um, I think one my opinion of why I think we may feel lonely is because there's a lot to consume out there we have a lot you know, and we have maybe some of us may not want to acknowledge it, or, or to a degree, there may be very degrees of, of FOMO, fear of missing out, something we, we think we should know but we don't know, and we're curious about it. Sometimes we'll ask maybe those who are around us, our friends, or, or sometimes we'll we have this, we'll go look it up, you know, try to see what's what's going on. I mean, or if you missed it, like it's gone, that moment's gone. Yeah, but there's there's tomorrow, or the next day, the next day there'll be that next whatever big thing, or there'll be that thing that that may have a, a direct effect on you, um, there'll be another layer to it. Uh, I think that, that, brings, that brings a lot. And that, that, that also maybe leads to social isolation because there's something out there happening that we don't think we know about, but we should. Mm -hmm. Whether we're trying to be conscientious or conscious about it, and it, it can be overwhelming. It can be, I, I, I can admit it. It's, it's, it can be tough, I think, to gather to gather people in a group, and I think you know you may have to start small, and then with the hope of of connectedness, word spreads, word of mouth, be it whatever how you do it in in, in person or or through through our various social media or, or phones, you know, calling somebody or you know handing out something, handing out flyers, and hopefully they'll be recycled and not just tossed into the ground. Oh, yeah. um, it, but it's 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 tough to to really um, gather people. We know that, but but you have to make an effort. Have to make an effort, and it, it takes bravery. I, and um, one of the um, psychiatrists I talked to for for this story uh, said exactly what you said. It's going to uh, take a uh, a brave, courageous level of uh, engagement, empathy, and, and vulnerability. And imagine trying to 
Hope you can do one of those three, and it could, it could, be, could be tough enough to do all 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 three. So, so. Can I add one more thing? Please. Sorry, I'm going to add one more thing. I guess um, one of the, I think, reasons why also um, loneliness exists is I think there's like this sense of like perfectionism that occurs with like all these Instagram bullshit and Pinterest and I love it all, but I also angers me. Um, but like, you know, everything looks good and I feel like if we don't achieve anything good, like I'd rather like hide away. And I feel like if we invite people into our homes, like we were talking about gathering, invite people to your homes when your home is like as is, like messy, whatever. Have people, you know, it's like have people stop. Tell my my challenge to you. Okay, sorry, I know we're getting ahead of ourselves, but my challenge to you is to to have like an open door policy of your dorm, of your home, of your apartment, whatever it is, and have people stop by and let them see you and your place as it is just the way you are and try to be okay with that. Just try, that's, just try. That's so interesting because I think that was really the last time I think my door was unlocked was when I was in college in my, in my dorm and the door was, would be unlocked or, you know, or the bolt would be out and people could just walk in. Some would knock, some wouldn't, you know, because you're in that communal space. I mean, you're sharing, you're sharing the bathroom. So, so better works, you kind of get to know people on your floor and whatnot. So. So yeah, so it was, you know, it was almost, it, and when I was in college, it was almost an insult that your door was locked, unless you know you had company or whatnot, but, you know, so to say. But yeah, I, I, I totally get it, and that, that, could, that is challenging. It, it's more challenging these days, for sure. All right, so we're nearing the, the second half here, at least. Um, the question again, what community-based solutions might help? And then a second part of that question, how can we implement these solutions? And uh, how do we open up to this whole idea of mutual belonging uh, as we do this? Um, so I'm going to go a little nerd alert on us. Um, and <laughs> when we think about what we do about it, I think one of the things that's missing is, again, is understanding why, why as individuals or why as a community may, we may be lonely or isolated. Um, because without really understanding that and understanding then what you're trying to solve, it's really hard to prove what's actually working. So if you wanted to prove that this event tonight is working, what is it working for? Is it, are we combating loneliness or are we combating isolation and why? So this can be, if, you're, if the reason why you are lonely is because you don't have enough opportunities for social engagement and social interaction, then this may work. Okay. If your problem, problem, if you are lonely because you think you suck and you have a negative self in it, image and you think no one wants to talk to you, then putting you in this environment may not actually help and like for me could be horrifying, right? So when we think about community organizations or community programs, we have, what are we targeting? What are we trying to do? And so that gets you a little bit into, it's so funny, as an anthropologist, I hated theory. I was, I, you know, like when I was writing my thesis, I'm like, God damn it, they keep asking me to write theory and I don't want to write about theory and now that's like all I talk about. Um, but it's a little bit of both. It's, you know, when I, when I now as a clinician and as a researcher, I work with several community organizations, one of them, Curry Senior Center, which works with older adults in the Tenderloin, um, the solutions we are proposing have to match what we think is going on. So we have a program going on where we're matching older adults in the community with peers. Um, so far, our, our data at looking at, you know, some of it's positive, some of it we don't know if we're making an effect, and it may be because we're asking the wrong question. The other thing that's interesting in this community, if you ask people there why they're not engaging, it's violence. So if we're not addressing violence, then we can't really get at the issue as to why people are actually isolated. So we have to really delve deep into and be purposeful with what we're doing. And the strategies and solutions, again, are going to be different from an individual level versus a um, community level, public health level, policy level. So for myself as an individual, when I'm feeling lonely, it's actually because I'm working too much and I'm not connecting with my husband. So for me, a very simple intervention is actually sitting at the, at the dining room table and having dinner together. It's a very simple thing. So if you tell me to go to a social club, that's not solving my problem. But that means I have to look deep inside and figure out, okay, why am I working so much and why I'm not spending time with my husband? If I look at my older adults, we have an incredible amount of ageism in our country and in our, in our 
society. And so if we don't value older adults and what happens with hearing impairment and vision impairment and disability, and if we think about our public spaces and how we're building senior housing with studio apartments that aren't exactly conducive to living with others, and what are we doing to actually promote community building? So it's really looking a little bit more in depth into what's going on. Thank you. Yeah, and um, yeah, and I wanna um, I wanna highlight two things that I heard today. There's like for me, um, I think there's definitely something about like purpose, right? Having clarity of what does the solution for this person, this community, this instance look like? What does the solution look like for, you know, so really the, the, the specialization and the uniqueness for everyone. Um, and I think that on a larger scale, um, there's, there's a way we can measure it. And I think equally importantly to measuring it is also feeling it, yeah. right? Is like being like, well, is it working? Like looking around and looking at the faces and is it working? And there's a part of us that knows. The other thing that I wanted to highlight is what you talked about with the cultural humility, because I actually did not know what that word really meant, or at least the way that I like knowing what it means now until you said that. Because it's like being humble with our culture. Like not thinking that the way that I am and the way that I be in the world is the only way to be and that I can't change and I can't grow, right? Because I think that the level to which we are willing to transform and to rewrite who we are and to change and to adapt and grow is the, e the level of ease with which we will have with connecting with other people. Because kind of like you were talking about with like social media and stuff, it's like, you know, if, if we're going to have this expectation that we need to have X followers and this level of perfection and, and whatever, it might be really hard to ever feel like we reached that thing of like, all right, I have friends, I have a community, I made it, right? But um, at least for me, I've been at a place where I had a gazillion friends and felt extremely lonely, right? I had a gazillion friends. Like, I was the guy with all the friends and, like, was capital D depressed, like, clinical, like, I don't want to get out of bed right now depressed, right? And it's because I wasn't l willing to let go of a story of how I be in the world. It was, like, my own cultural person personal culture of Mazin, my ego was like, well, this is who I am, and this is how I am in the world. But when I was humbled, <coughs> humbled, depression will definitely humble you. It's like deep rest, depressed, right? I was like, I'm a rest and, you know, not move. My body is like, we're not wearing this mask anymore. That's how Jim Carrey puts it, right? So being able to take off the mask for a second and be like, all right, like, this isn't working. Like, am I humble enough to see that the way that I'm out in the world is not working, that wearing this mask is not working? Can I be vulnerable? Can I, can, I, can I actually like rewrite who I am? And it was like, okay, I'm going to have to let go of this facade of who I am and how I've been living and trying to reach these unrealistic expectations. I'm going to have to let some of these relationships, these like, you know, situationships, maybe they're not real friendships, uh, let them go. And, you know, by saying no to those, saying yes to the things that are really connecting you, you know dinner with my husband, I don't have a husband, but I'm, but dinner with the friends that, the friendships that really nourish me. So the last thing I'll say about that too is, so that's on a personal level, on a larger level, looking at our relationship to the culture we're in, right? And seeing is like, is it serving me? Or do I want to look into my history, my lineage, into the cultures around me and find different ways of being, different norms and different values, right? And actually change the culture that I'm living in the world through. Um, because, yeah, there's definitely as aspects of the current culture that are not uh, showing results as, f as far as uh, supporting us and not feeling lonely. So sometimes we need to not say more, right? And take some time to reflect on what was said. So just one minute. He said so much, and some of it really resonated with you.
thing. And then, like going to a potluck, and you just can't stop eating because <laughs> it's so good and there's so many desserts and I'm already full with a coarse meal, but I just continue. Less is really more, yeah. Um, it's hard to respond at all after that. It's like, I like the less. I, I can feel the less. It's, uh, it's very, very good, actually. Um, I can't help it. I, I'm loving these ideas, but I'm also looking out, and I'm really wondering if you talk to your neighbors. If you said hi to your neighbors, maybe just take a moment and do that. I would feel better if, if maybe you will, too. Just say hi to your neighbors if you haven't done that, you know? Baby, five, sorry. This issue of loneliness, uh, isolation, separation, and what do we do about this belonging, this otherness, um, and our belongingness? So, yeah, let's start up here. I actually wanted to piggyback on your moment of silence first, if that's okay. Um, one of the breakouts that I'll be leading in this room, and I will actually have a series of silent connections. Um, I think words are very powerful. They can be used as bridges, but they can also be used as shields and walls. And so um, if you're interested in exploring more what silence can do of just being together, and how that can create intimacy and connection um, and help reduce loneliness. Stay in this room for the second session. That's all I have to say. Um, if we're going to be close to concluding, um, yeah, uh, I want to share something from like what I wrote in my piece and just by coming across this. Um, I found it very interesting because this goes across all lines through race, gender, even political affiliations. Um, uh, Nebraska uh, Senator Ben Sass has this book that just came out called Them, Why We Hate Each Other. And he, um, he, he makes some good points about uh, why there's a lack of maybe community these days, why we feel disconnected. Um, I encourage everybody to read the book or read some passages online because I think it really relates. Um, because it, it just, like I said, it, it just, I think it's something we can all kind of relate to. Um, and I'll just read this. In his book, Senator Sass says Americans don't have the, quote, community thickness, unquote, like we used to. He thinks we want to be a part of something bigger. And to do so, we need to connect more in more meaningful ways. Quote, what we need are new habits of mind and heart. We need new practices of neighborliness. We need to get our hands dirty, replenishing a soil that nourishes rooted, purposeful lives. Just, I'll leave that and let us all just maybe carry that momentum into our sessions. Okay, closing comment. Um, I think what, what someone said is that, you know, loneliness is part of the human condition. I mean, it's very ingrained in, in who we are, and there's something really powerful biologically about that because it's actually telling us we need to find our people our tribe, whoever that may be. Um, and so it's actually really valuable and positive if we identify that and say, hey, you know, I need help. I need to connect with other people. So let's think about this as a positive thing. And, and, I, and that's what helps me um, in that when I'm feeling shitty and lonely, it's, you know, that's a sign to me that I'm at risk. Um, whatever that may be, and I need to connect with those other people. And sometimes it's really difficult. I was talking to someone else earlier about I get tired, my couch is super comfortable, I'm a popcorn addict, it's like really hard to get off my couch. Um, but I have amazing friends that I don't often connect with. And there is this, I think about it in terms of protecting my health and my life and my community about as much as going to the gym or having a healthy meal, it's having that social engagement. And I tell my older adult patients this, like it's being purposeful about these things, not in an obligatory sense, but that I feel rejuvenated when I do these things. So let's turn it into something positive that we do for ourselves and for the people around us.
Yeah, I, I think I want to close by really emphasizing something you said, which is loneliness is not who you are. Loneliness is how you feel in a moment. No one is inherently alone, even if we try to pretend that we are. And so letting loneliness be a feeling, it's an experience, it's not who we are and we cannot let it define us. And reiterating that as much as we're willing to transform and to change and rewrite and to grow is as much ease as we will find, I think, in connecting with others. And the last piece is thinking less of like, well, I need connection and I need and I need and I need, but think about what can I contribute? Because trust me, it's way easier to answer that question. If we're feeling lonely, we're like, okay, well, what have I got? Like, what can I go out and share? How, like, that's the easiest and simplest and quickest way to connect is to go out and contribute something. Because, you know, asking that question of like, what is purpose? It's in this, that moment that you're giving something of yourself. That is the moment both that you have purpose and the moment that you belong. Because we belong where we make our contribution. Right, where we have a sense of purpose is where we belong. Because then we're a part of the cycle, of the ecosystem, of, of, of nature, of life. So yeah, <laughs> think not of what your community <laughs> can do for you, but what can I do for my community? So to speak. Who said that? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the trickery of believing that you are alone. Thank you for poking that. Please. Yes, yes. And I heard a song when I saw this weird movie, Phantom of the Opera. It had a song, and it, I, I wrote the lyrics, just a little part I'm going to read, because it was so strange. The name of the song is to learn to be loved. And I just thought, ew. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. It says... I'm not going to sing it, but it says, Child of the wilderness, born into emptiness, learn to be lonely. Learn to find your way in darkness. And it starts questioning, who will be there for you? Who will comfort and care for you? Just learn to be lonely and learn to be your own companion. Ooh, you're not alone. We're together. Mm. That's right. I've, I've uh, just a closing comment for myself. I, I'm curious. We haven't talked more about the role of the arts. So I, I, I find the arts really invite us to connect. And I know that many people here know that. Just I want to make sure that that is acknowledged. That uh, I remember being at once at Harley Strictly. Some of you have gone, and I remember looking down at very different people. And, and some had a nice decked out place, and all the, the great the champagne glasses, all uh, the right kind of food, everything. And here's some people who are pretty much homeless, and there were some a whole mix of people there. And on came this song, and we're all singing it together. Every one of us. And I remember people looking at each other in the, in the eyes and, and seeing the difference in class that they had, and it didn't matter. It didn't matter right then. Somehow, what we, we know we belong from some, in some place when we're in that purpose together. And the arts remind us. You know, you put on the right piece of song, you dance, and, and you get safe enough in the room to really dance your full dance, right? <laughs> right, your full dance, and you know you're connected, right? So there's something about safety in the space, but something about you claiming the safety and the art forms that help. <laughs> so I, I, believe, I believe we're shifting now to, uh, to, uh, to social groups, and I want to mention to those that are here in my class that you, you should attend those. That's where the role will be taking for tonight. <laughs> Just saying, sense of community with a little reinforcement. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, I guess pass this to Tom or who's you know, Tom? Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
Thank you, everyone.